can you hear me now? <laughs> Thank you so much, Wanda, for letting me know that I had no sound. I didn't realize that um, I just reinstalled drivers today, and sometimes when I reinstall drivers, it makes everything a little wonky. But we're good. Sounds good. Sounds working. I hope so. <laughs> but uh, again, so Tansei Oki, bonzu, hello. Um, yeah, I just wanted to talk about, oh my gosh, so many things. Uh, but before I realized there was no sound, <laughs> I was talking about uh, really honoring the teachings that we share, um, honoring where they've come from, uh, honoring the stories behind them, um, and yay, <laughs> my sound is working! <laughs> uh, so, ooh, well, <laughs> it's funny when that happens. I don't know. I think Creator tries to just put you on your toes, and technology is there to keep us on our toes and really teach us to be humble and to not take things for granted. So I learn a lot from you know, my computer and technology. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Wanda. Um, so just uh, to welcome everybody before I get started, I always love to acknowledge the land upon which we stand. Because if you don't know where you are, then how do you know where you're going? So this, uh, where I am standing, is the land of the Treaty 7 people. It uh, was known once as the Blackfoot Confederacy, uh, or Mokinstis. And Mokinstis literally means elbow in Blackfoot. It's where the Elbow River and the Bow River come together, and it's that confluence. And what you'll notice is um, more, all the forts that were built across Canada were usually built along rivers, around confluences, because that's a natural space of gathering. We see animals gather around rivers. We, as people, gather around rivers it's the way that we connect because we need water to live but we also need connection to live we need you know to build community in a meaningful way and this is where um, a lot of our people would gather this is where we would gather to have ceremony and to share stories and share teachings and build community and share medicines and trade and do all of these wonderful things in the past but we still have that spirit in all of these places this is where some of our biggest cities have you know come up around those traditional grounds of community connection. And so I think when we do land acknowledgements, we really have to understand what was here before us, what brought us all here, and why we're so connected to this land. And so I honor the Blackfoot of Siksika, Gainai, and Bagani. I honor the Tsutsuna, or the Beaver people, and I also honor the Stony Nakoda of Morley, which includes Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. Uh, we're also walking in the footsteps of Métis Region 3, which is why I proudly wear my Métis sash to act as that bridge between Indigenous and non-Indigenous culture. Um, I am Cree, Anishinaabe, and Métis from Muskeg Lake Cree Nation in Saskatchewan. Um, our reserve had, uh, well, mainly Cree, uh, but after the... Um, I want to call it a rebellion. It wasn't a rebellion. We were standing for, for what's right. We weren't rebelling against anything. We were standing up for the truth. Um, but during uh, the Métis Revolution, <laughs> we um, offered horses and warriors and supplies and weapons and food and everything. So our uh, reserve has this huge history of standing up for what's right, of continuing and building those relationships across Canada. And so after um, everything happened and you know, the revolution uh, was kind of broken apart and a lot of uh, Anishinaabe and Métis were displaced. Um, they had no place to go. And so our reserve took them on. And then when the government was like, those are Cree or those are Anishinaabe and those are uh, Métis. And they're like, no, no, just Cree. And so <laughs> my cooking for the longest time is like, we're just Cree. We're not going to talk about the other people in the family because according to the government, we're just Cree, even though we are Anishinaabe and Métis. So <laughs> I honor that history, and it's um, it's just so reassuring that we're actually coming to a place of honoring that truth of that history behind a lot of uh, our reserves, behind a lot of our families, behind a lot of our connections, and you know those communities that were left behind. And I realized that I have left my phone on, and I never do that, so I apologize. Actually, I've done it recently. Again, creator keeps you on your toes. Yay. <laughs> But, um, yeah, just to welcome everybody into the circle today, I wanted to start with the Cree Welcome Song, which I always do. Uh, this song was taught to me several years ago, and it's just really um, unfolded the path in front of me. I love to connect community, and I love to build those networks and, um, you know, introduce people and give people opportunities whenever I can to, you know, to learn and connect and, you know, build strong relationships and friendships and really heal our communities, heal those connections. And so this song has really been instrumental in that. 
This song is from the Nathahau family from Sturgeon Lake Cree Nation, which is in, uh, well, it's on the border of Saskatchewan and Alberta. And so I honor that family for keeping this song and this story alive. Because again, for so many generations, we couldn't. We couldn't share our songs, we couldn't share our stories. Um, you know, we, we couldn't be who we were. We couldn't wear regalia or smudge or be in ceremony. But now we're coming to that place where we can't. Not only can we, but we can be proud of it. And I'm so thankful to be in this time. And this song really is that reminder of that, but it's also that reminder of community connection. When we sing songs traditionally, we sing in rounds of four to honor the four directions of the medicine wheel. But this song we sing in rounds of three, and that's to keep the circle open and welcoming so everyone completes the circle today. Because in a circle, we're all connected. There's no beginning, there's no end. No one is greater or less than anyone else in the circle, just like in the hoop of life. So it teaches us to honor each other for those differences. Because if everybody was exactly the same, the world would be incredibly boring and nothing would ever get done. So <laughs> we need those differences to be inclusive, to honor everybody in their journey. And it teaches us not to judge someone, not to compare ourselves to other people, because we're not on that path. We're somewhere else. And if we're too busy criticizing other people, we forget you know, the journey that we need to be on. And so it's really about self-reflection, but also honoring everyone else's journey and realizing that we're so connected. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we're gonna agree 100% of the time, but it's those moments when we can come together and find those compromises. That's truly what makes our community resilient because those divisions are what's hurting our community right now. We're so polarized that we forget that we're one and the same, that you know, when we say all my relations, we are all related, the plants and the animals and everyone. And so, um, yeah, this song really honors that. It honors that connection. When we sing it in three rounds, it's to keep the circle open, to remind us to keep our hearts open, to keep our circle open. And if someone has to leave or, um, you know, if someone comes in halfway through the ceremony or through the circle, um, that's okay, because there's that space to do that. There's that breathing room to do that. Um, and so Mia Sin, which is the Cree welcome song, it doesn't just mean welcome, it also means beautiful. Me a sin, me a sin, a sin, a online I'm out of here or he'll sneak up behind me and start to eat my sweet grass because he loves it uh, so I have to like keep my sweet grass packed up and away for the most part or wrapped up for the most part um, 
I think so. I think my cat was trying to sing along. <laughs> Hopefully you heard that lovely chorus. Um, but of course I wanted to start uh, with a smudge just to um, you know, honor the day. Uh, I smudge every day and on the days that I don't smudge I find that I'm really really stressed out um, and it just puts you in a good space. It really honors your body, it really honors your mind and your spirit and your emotions and it brings them all together in a good way, in a balanced way. So when we smudge it's all about balance, and it's about um, you know honoring those teachings. Um, I lay out all my medicines even if I don't use them every single time I always lay them out to honor each of those directions and um, my medicine wheel might be different than your medicine wheel or than somebody else's medicine wheel because it's just really about uh, what you need in your life and so your teachings might differ depending on who you've learned them from and they might change throughout your life and that's okay too it's really about just honoring your journey and it's not about right or wrong it's just different and that's okay <laughs> you know and we're completely different from each other and that's great that's an amazing thing because we all have different roles to play in community and even with our teachings they reflect different aspects of who we are they reflect different aspects of our journey um this is why my medicine wheel is different than a blackfoot medicine wheel because I'm, I'm Cree and Ojibwe, of course my medicine wheel is going to be different because the teachings are different. Even the medicines that are on those medicine wheels could differ from nation to nation. Um, and the direction that we travel differs from nation to nation. So being Cree, I start in the east because um, that's where Grandfather Sun rises. And then I go to the south, to the west, and then to the north. Whereas my good friend, who's Mohawk, um, the Great Lakes reflect the sun. So she goes the other way. She starts in the east, but then goes to the north then to the west, then to the south to close. And so it, again, not right or wrong, just different. And it's important to honor and respect, you know, those different teachings from all of those nations, but also learn from them, understand what the motivation behind those differences are, because the, in that we'll find a lot of similarities and a lot of understanding. Um, and so I'm just going to introduce my medicines very, very quickly. Um, I usually go really, really in depth, but it takes me like an hour to go in depth on all of the medicines and all of the teachings and all of the science behind them but um i'll just introduce my medicine wheel in the east i have sweet grass uh sweet grass is for our mind it's for grandfather son for the power of fire and our childhood in the south we have cedar and cedar is our connection to our physical body it's our connection to the south of course um to our adolescence to mother earth and to growth to really um, deeply understand and connect to the earth. It reminds us about always giving something back before we take anything because we have a relationship to maintain. We have a reciprocal relationship to maintain with the land uh, and the animals. And in the West, we have sage. When I thank my sister, Shelly, for bringing this to me, my sister from another mother. <laughs> um, this is buffalo sage. And this is what we will be using today. So I'm just gonna Peel off those lovely, lovely leaves. Ooh, that's a good one. Awesome. Um, and sage is, uh, it's connected to water, it's connected to community, it's connected to our heart medicine. Um, it's also connected to Grandmother Moon, so it's women's teachings within sage. Uh, and yeah, it just teaches us about, you know, entering into adulthood as well. That's the phase of our life there. And, it smells amazing. <laughs> so it's really cool about buffalo sage is when you crunch it up. Well, first it doesn't really smell like too much, but then as soon as you crunch it up and roll it, it just unlocks all of the, uh, the smells and the leaves. And so I'm going to just add a bit more to that. It's more kicking around. It's kind of fallen all over my desk, but that's okay. Oops. Ah. And then I'll have enough to smudge with. More than enough to smudge with. And then the last medicine that I have laid out is um, tobacco. So of course, Mother Earth tobacco. I also have tobacco that I was gifted from a lovely school. Uh, and then Kinsasa, which is red willow bark, which is an anti-inflammatory and it's great for headaches. Oh, for oh, I forgot. Um, I have to. I have some that I have to bring to my mom because she's getting migraines again. So I have to go give that to her. So thank you. <laughs> virtual world for reminding me. Uh, yeah, so we're only going to smudge with sage today. Of course, being the women's medicine, uh, me being Cree, I tend to smudge with a lot of sage. I'm going to just add an extra ball just in case I need it. Ooh. Ooh. Awesome. 
I might not, but never hurts to be prepared. <laughs> There's no right or wrong way to uh, smudge. It's whatever feels good to you. Right. Smudge very quickly. Uh, it's a way to cleanse and balance and ask for the things that you need in your life. Um, and some people say, you know, this is the way to pray, or this is the way to just honor yourself. It's our way to cleanse, heal, um, set intention, uh, or make wishes. <laughs> well, that's the wise elder told me a couple days ago, but you can't wish to win the lottery because that's not quite the same. <laughs> Okay, maybe I need a new, I think I need a, oh, a new match strike stick. There we go. Lit a lot of matches off of that, so I think it's just done. And notice I'm fanning it with my hand. I never blow on it because our breath is our life and our life is precious. And we don't waste that for anybody. Uh, you can fan it with a hand, or a feather, or a fan. Uh, my cats keep stealing my feathers, so I don't have feathers anymore. I put them away in a safe place because, yeah, they don't last. <laughs> so the first thing I do is I cleanse my hands. Again, this is just how I smudge. You can smudge in any way. My kids just, you know, they smudge the essentials, their head, their heart, their belly button, and their whole being, and then they say, thanks, Mom, and then they leave. <laughs> But again, everybody does it differently. I have, um, I know one person that smudges each side of their body. So this, his Blackfoot teachings are you give with one, you receive with the other. And so he goes down one side and he goes up the other. And those are just his teachings. So everybody has different ways to do it. I think it's really important to learn all of those ways because you never know what's really gonna resonate with you. So I get over my body four times to honor the four directions in my body smudge my mind so I can think clearly and learn from every person that crosses my path so I can remember more because as I age I'm starting to forget a lot more but also so I can be open-minded and never rigid with my thinking because how else are we going to learn I smudge my ears so I stay open to all of the messages that creator has for me so I can hear them but also to remind myself I have two ears and one mouth so I can listen twice as much as I speak to listen to that stillness where that wisdom lies. I smudge my eyes. I'm very thankful for my vision this lifetime so I can see all of the beauty that surrounds me and all the gifts that Creator has given me, but also so I can see the unseen and to remind myself to be humble enough to believe in things that we can't necessarily see. I smudge my nose so I can smell danger and cookies and um, just recently an elder said and nature and I think that's such a beautiful thing to say so and nature um, especially now we're, we're smelling all of those plants coming to being and to bloom and um, we're starting to really smell like the lilac in the um, apple blossoms on the breeze and it's just a beautiful smell so I honor that but it reminds us also of those you know, the senses, those things that we can smell in the wind that the bear knows and he tries to teach us, but to really be more aware. I smudge my mouth. So I speak true and kind words that are helpful, benefit people. I always ask myself, is it truthful? Is it helpful? Is it kind? Is it respectful? If it's none of those things, don't say it, don't do it. I'm going to smudge my throat because I'm very thankful for my voice this lifetime so I can continue to give voice to the voiceless but also to honor the voice that creator has gifted me and remember to always speak out. I'm very thankful for my singing voice this lifetime. I smudge my lungs so I breathe good clean air. Be thankful for the sacred breath that we all share. So we're breathing the same air that our relatives have been breathing that we've been breathing with the trees and the plants and the animals for thousands of generations. We need to remember the sacredness in that breath. Smudge my stomach so all of the food that I eat this day will nourish my body. Smudge my motherhood because I'm very thankful to be a woman and a mother in this time. I'm a two-spirit woman and I carry a lot of men's ceremonies um, as well as men's teachings 
but I also carry a lot of two-spirit teachings, so it's important to understand that balance in each and every one of us and to honor and respect the responsibilities that you've been gifted. I smudge my belly button because I'm very thankful for my spirit this lifetime, which have guided me in a good way. Our belly button is where we're connected before we come into this world. It's what feeds us. It's what connects us to home and our spirit. This is where our intuition and our connection to our ancestors lies. And this is why whenever we have that gut instinct, it's never wrong. <laughs> it's what our intuition is. It's our spirit speaking with us. I'm going to smudge my heart. I'm very thankful for all of the love that I surround myself with, for my family, for my friends. Help me to share unconditional love and honor them with kindness and compassion for my family, for my friends, for those I have yet to meet, and for myself. You always have to pray for yourself because sometimes people forget. I smudge my shoulders and my back so I can carry all of the responsibilities that Creator has gifted me with grace and humility. Be thankful for the responsibilities that you have. I smudge my arms and my hands so I can do the good work that Creator's put me here to do. I'm very thankful for the path that I walk on. I smudge my legs so I can walk this red road in a good way. And that's that path of Aboriginal spirituality. It is our own path to tread, not anyone else's to enforce. And I smudge my feet so I stay grounded and connected, honoring Mother Earth and treading lightly upon her, honoring her with every step. And then I'm going to smudge anywhere else that you need a little extra love. So I always smudge my hips because of the amount of hip surgeries <laughs> that I've had. And when you're all done, you can um, pray for your friends, your family, anyone that you want to send that love and appreciation to or that healing to. Maybe they've just been in your thoughts a lot lately. Don't forget to reach out if they have been. Uh, and then when you're done, you say uh, thank you in your language, which for me is hi hi or uh, maguich, chi maguich, and merci. Awesome. So hi hi. I'm going to have a sip of water. Uh, I'm going to share. Hmm. I'm going to share the creation song today and the creation story because it's really been on my mind lately. Um, I really love storytelling. It's really uh, a passion of mine, but I also love how the stories change depending on who's listening to them. Um, and so, you know, if I ask kids in a class to write down uh, what they think the story was about or what they think the lesson was in that story, it's amazing to hear how all of them have different lessons. Um, some of them have the similar ones, but different aspects of it. And so it's really lovely to reflect that on a regular basis. And even adults, we learn different things from those stories. We'll hear the same story a thousand times in our own life. But each time we hear it, it's going to mean something different. It's going to have a different significance depending on what we're going through, what we've experienced, um, the teachings that we need. Ooh. I'm also going to close my door so that the cat doesn't get loud anymore. <laughs> so um, the Cree creation story is actually a recreation story. So a long, long, long time ago, uh, the two leggeds were here before. So we're considered the two leggeds because, of course, we walk around on two legs. And we're kind of shaped and molded um, in creator's image. And uh, also, um, like, Wasaka Jack is also very, very similar. Wasaka Jack is mm, he's a little bit of a trickster spirit. He gets into a lot of trouble. Uh, he kind of shirks his responsibilities a lot of the time. And so it's um, he's a little bit of a problem. But um, when we were created, Wasaka Jack's job was to teach us how to live on the earth. He was uh, to teach us um, how to honor each other, how to honor wisdom, how to pray, how to honor creator, how to honor the plants and the animals, how to take them in a good way, in a sustainable way, how to give something back for you before you take them. He was also supposed to teach us um, you know, how to honor the water, how to keep it clean, how to keep it healthy. Uh, he was supposed to teach us how to honor the land itself so it didn't dry out. Um, and there was a bunch of things that he was supposed to teach us. But like I said, sometimes he just I don't know if it's just negligence or <laughs> boredom, but he wandered off and he didn't teach us how to live on the land. He didn't teach us how to take care of the land, how to take care of the animals, how to take care of the water, how to take care of the air or the earth, or how to take care of each other. And we didn't 
have an idea. So it's just like kids, if you don't teach them that base, <laughs> everything's going to fall apart. And so um, we started just destroying things. We started taking and taking and taking without giving anything back to the earth. And so the earth started to get depleted. And there was very little in the way of plants left that were growing back. We started overhunting all of the animals and not even using the whole part of them, only using what we felt like in that moment. And so many of these rotting carcasses were just causing sickness in the land, but also running downstream. And the animals started to get depleted too, because they didn't have a chance to, you know, rejuvenate themselves and come back. And then we kept just dumping things into the rivers, into the oceans. And so the, the water started to get sick. And when the water started to get we sick, we started to get sick. When the plants were gone, the air started to get sick because nothing was being cleansed. And then of course, we were fighting over scraps, which whatever was left over. And so we started to kill each other, which is not a good thing. And so Creator, I don't know where he, uh, where Creator was, maybe vacation, who knows, but uh, came and saw this mess of the earth and said, Wasagajak, you were supposed to teach these people how to live on the earth. What happened? And he's like, oh, well, I forgot to do it. Um, I'm just going to go have a nap. And so he curled up under a tree and he started to fall asleep. But Creator like well we got to wash this away we got to restart we need a mulligan we need a do-over and so it started to rain and it started to rain harder and harder and harder and Wasaka Jack who was sleeping under a tree felt the water from the river that he was sleeping beside come over his toes he kind of opened one eye and he thought oh, it's not that bad and he closed his eyes and then he felt it rise over his knees and then he knew that something was up, but he thought, okay, well, maybe I'll just to sleep for a little bit longer. And then as he opened his eyes, he watched as the river rose to his waist and he knew that this meant business. It meant that a big flood was coming and he knew that he had to do something to protect whatever animals were left. And so they could rebuild the earth. And he thought, okay, who will know what to do? Who will know what to do? The beaver. The beaver is the smartest animal that he knew and he thought, well, the beaver will always have wonderful solutions, and so I'll go talk to the beaver. And so he ran to the beaver, and she always created amazing situa uh, you know, dams, and she was able to you know, see the way that the river needed to go, and so perhaps she would have wisdom and insight into what to do. And she, he said, beaver, beaver, there's a huge flood, and it's going to be coming, and it's going to be covering the earth, and we need to save all of the animals that are left, but we also need to rebuild the earth. What are we going to do? And the beaver thought for a moment, and she thought, and she thought, and she said, well, the Sakajak, I've never been in a situation like this before, but I know that the oldest living cedar tree, she will probably have a great idea of what to do and how we were going to protect and save everyone. So let's go speak with her. And so together with Sakajak and beaver went to see the beautiful, beautiful cedar tree. She was the oldest living cedar tree on earth. She stood towering above the earth, like she was in a huge, huge tower. She was huge. And uh, you couldn't even, like 10 people trying to reach around touching hands couldn't because she was that big. She was that old and ancient and that wise. Um, because of course she had seen since the beginning of creation, she had grown and grown and grown. And, and then um, Osaka Jack said, cedar, cedar, we have a problem. And the beaver said, there's a flood coming, Cedar, and we don't know what to do. How are we going to protect the world? And how are we going to rebuild the earth? And how are we going to protect all of the animals? What are we going to do, Cedar? And the cedar thought for a moment, and she said very graciously, well, beaver, you will have to cut me down. And the beaver said, no, 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 no. I don't want to cut you down. There's got to be other options. And the cedar said, no, you'll need to cut me down. And you'll hollow me out. And I will create a boat for everyone to climb into, and you will be able to rebuild the earth. And don't worry, beaver, because I will be reborn on that new earth, and you will remember my spirit. And beaver very reluctantly agreed and cut her down. And so as beaver was cutting down the cedar tree, there was a loud crack. And as that massive cedar tree finally fell to the ground, the whole world shook, boom, boom, as she hit the ground. And so it summoned all of the animals that were left from all around. And so, of course, they skirted around all of the two leggeds that were too busy killing each other to even notice that the animals were running by. And they all climbed into this beautiful boat that the beaver had hollowed out out of the beautiful cedar tree. 
And as everyone, that last animal finally climbed in the boat, the water started to get higher and higher and higher. And as they watched over the edge, they watched as the oceans rose over the land and joined up and linked with the rivers to coat the land. But it didn't stop. It continued to rain harder and harder and harder. And the water got deeper and deeper and deeper until over the edge, all they could see was darkness in the bottom of the ocean that covered the entire earth. And it continued to rain for days and nights and days and nights. And that ocean seemed to get deeper and darker the more it rained. And the animals started thinking, well, maybe it's never going to stop raining. Maybe we're going to be stuck in this boat forever. What are we going to do? Until one day it just stopped. It stopped raining. And Wasakajak knew that this was a sign. It was time to rebuild the earth. And so Wasakajak said, we need to rebuild the earth. How are we going to do that? Mm, I'll go talk to the beaver. So again, he reached out to the beaver and he said, beaver, you're the wisest and smartest animal I know. You come up with the best solutions. How are we going to rebuild the earth? And the beaver thought for a moment. And she thought. And she thought. And she said, well, I suppose we would need to gather earth from the bottom of the ocean before we could rebuild. And Wasaka Jack thought, that's a great idea. Once we have the earth, I can definitely rebuild it. But who's going to go get it? And the beaver said, well, I'm, I'm a pretty good swimmer. I, I might be able to reach the bottom. And so the beaver dove out of the side of the boat. She dove down deeper and deeper and deeper. But it was so deep, she couldn't reach the bottom. She swam up to the top and she said, Wasaka Jack, it is so far down. I couldn't hold my breath. I'm not sure anyone could hold their breath. It's really far. And Wasaka Jack said, well, we have so many animals. I'm sure somebody will be able to reach the bottom. And so all of the animals started to talk. Well, which animal could reach the bottom? What talents would we need to reach the bottom? And the diver said, well, we are excellent divers. Perhaps we could reach the bottom. And so the first step was the eagle. The eagle could fly the highest, so assumed he could dive the deepest. So the eagle flew higher than he had ever flown before, and he dove straight down into the water. But he couldn't reach the bottom. And he swam back up to the top, and he said, Wasaka Jacket is so far down. I couldn't dive to reach the bottom, and I can reach the highest in the sky. Perhaps we need a better diver, and climbed back in the boat. And then the uh, amazing, fabulous Kingfisher, who is a phenomenal diver, uh, said, well, perhaps I can reach the bottom. And so the kingfisher flew higher than he had ever flown in the sky before, and he dove straight down into the water, cutting it like a knife. He used his wings to dive down deeper and deeper and deeper, but it was so far down and he could not hold his breath that long. He swam up to the top and he said, Wasaka Jack, it is so far down, I don't think any of us, me being the best diver, any of the divers could reach the bottom. I think you'll have to ask others. And so he asked the swimmers, he said, swimmers, which of you could reach the bottom? Well, the beaver had already tried and she was quite a strong swimmer. And the turtle said, I could probably reach the bottom. I could hold my breath longer than anyone. Let me try. And so she dove out of the boat. She dove down deeper and deeper and deeper. But as she dove down deeper, the pressure became stronger and harder on her shell until she heard a loud and bubbles came out. She swam up to the top and she said, Wasaka Jack, it is so far down. The pressure was so much. And as she climbed back into the boat, everyone looked at her beautiful shell, which had cracked into 13 big bits and 28 ridges along the outside. And this to the day, to this day, that is reflected in the turtle shell. Wasaka Jack said, well, what about the biggest animals? They're so big, maybe the pressure of the ocean won't hurt them. And so the moose said, well, I'm a pretty reasonable diver. Let me try. Or I'm a pretty reasonable swimmer and I'm large. Let me try. And so, of course, she dove in. She dove down deeper and deeper, but she couldn't reach the bottom. She was 
not made for diving in the ocean. She got back in the boat, and then the bear said, well, I'm the, one of the biggest animals, maybe I can try. And so he dove into the water, and he tried to dive, but it was right after hibernation, so he was carrying a little bit of extra weight, and he just kind of bobbed in the water for a little bit. And all of the animals said, oh, bear, this is unbearable to watch. Get back in the boat. <laughs> and so um, all of the animals thought, well, what about the fastest swimmers? If they're fast enough, perhaps they can reach the bottom. And so all of the fastest swimmers talked and they decided, well, what about the otter? The otter is one of the fastest swimmers. Let her try. And so she stood up proudly and said, Miss Jack, I'm the fastest swimmer. I can definitely reach the bottom because I am super fast. And so she dove out of the boat and she dove down deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, but she couldn't reach the bottom. And she swam up to the top. She hopped in the boat. And she said, Miss well, Jack, it's so far down. I couldn't hold my breath that long. And there's no way anybody can reach the bottom. I'm pretty sure nobody can reach the bottom. If I can't reach the bottom, how is anybody going to reach the bottom? And she climbed back in. And now all of the animals looked at each other. The largest animals had tried, the fastest animals had tried, the best swimmers had tried, and the best divers had tried, but no one could reach the bottom. All of the animals were feeling overwhelmed and feeling like there was no hope to rebuild the earth until there was a tiny voice from inside the boat that said, I can do it. They all looked around and they said, who said that? And then they heard it again, I can do it. They looked again. Who said that? And the tiny little muskrat made her way through the crowd. She stood up on her hind legs, puffed out her chest proudly and said, I can't do it. And all of the animals just erupted in laughter. They started to laugh so hard. All of the large animals said, oh, oh, muskrat, you're so tiny and puny. How are you supposed to reach the bottom if we couldn't reach the bottom? All of the divers said, muskrat, you're not the best diver. How are you supposed to reach the bottom if we couldn't reach the bottom? All of the best swimmers started laughing and said, muskrat, you're not that strong of a swimmer and you can't hold your breath that long. How are you supposed to reach the bottom if we couldn't. And then the fastest swimmers started to laugh at her. <laughs> Muskrat, you're so tiny. You're so slow. There's no way you can reach the bottom. We can reach the bottom. We're the fastest swimmers ever. How are you supposed to reach the bottom? And as all of the animals were laughing, Muskrat did not lose hope. She stood on the edge of the boat and said, I can't do it. And as she took the deepest breath she had ever taken in her life, she dove straight into the water. She dove down deeper and deeper and deeper, and all of the animals who were in the boat laughing, they realized, wait a second, Muskrat's gone, she jumped. And so they all looked over the edge of the boat and they saw Muskrat disappearing into the darkness. And they all waited <laughs> and laughed, waiting for her to come back up, but she didn't return. And they waited longer and longer and they knew there was no way Muskrat could have held her breath that long. Nobody could hold their breath that long. And then they watched as a single bubble of air floated to the surface. And they knew that that was Muskrat's very last breath. And they began to cry. And they cried and they cried and they cried so hard that they turned the ocean salty with their tears and wondered, Muskrat, Muskrat, why would you do that? Why would you try and why would you give up your life? Why would you sacrifice yourself for all of us? And then they started to feel bad that they had laughed at her in the beginning. Wasakajak looked over the boat for any sign of Muskrat until eventually he saw a little silhouette floating towards the top. As it got closer, they saw that it was Muskrat and her lifeless body. Wasakajak reached in with all his might and held Muskrat tight to his chest. He began to cry. He cried and he cried and he cried so hard and wiped all of the color off Muskrat's belly. And he said, Muskrat, why would you do that? Why would you sacrifice yourself? And as all of the animals were sobbing, Muskrat's tiny little paw flopped Open. and in the palm of her hand was a little ball of earth. Muskrat had done it. She had sacrificed herself for everyone. And now they could rebuild the earth and start a new life. Everyone was so thankful and so happy, but still sad at the same time. It was a very fe a weird feeling. 
Right. The sack of Jack knew he had to get to work with that beautiful ball of earth. And he asked all of the animals, who, who will carry this earth on their back? And the turtle said, I will carry this earth on my back. Very graciously, she climbed into the water. And Wasakajak put that ball of earth on her back and began to roll it out. And as he did, it grew bigger and bigger and larger and larger and wider and heavier and heavier until it pushed Turtle below the waves, carrying all of the land on her back. And this is why our earth is known as Turtle Island. And then Wasakajak continued, and it spread out to all of the land that we see to this day, covering everywhere on the earth, on Turtle Island. And Wasakajak knew that it was time to get to work, so he told all of the animals to go to all of the places that they would live on Turtle Island. And he took a deep breath to the east and as he blew to the east grandfather sun came out from behind the clouds grandfather sun shone with all of his love and all of his might and as he did he warmed the earth and the earth started to spring forth all of this new life all of the little plants started to bloom all of the animals bellies became huge and pregnant with new life many eggs started to form all over turtle island then when sakajak took another deep breath to the south and as he did turtle island began to rumble it began to shake huge mountains started to reach into the sky valleys started to dip across turtle island hills started to roll across turtle island many of the trees that we thought were lost started to rumble and shake and grow strong 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 high into the sky and reaching their roots deep into turtle island to hold her tight and then the sackajack blew again <gasps> to the west and as he did grandmother moon came out and she shone with all of her beauty all of her wisdom and all of her light and she pushed with all of her love and all of the waters washed over turtle island as she pulled back all of the waters receded she continued to push and pull push and pull creating all of the tides as the waters rushed over they became the lakes and the rivers and the streams and the ponds and the sloughs and all of the muskate that we see today and Wasakajak took another deep breath <sighs> to the north. And as he did, the winds began to spin. They spun faster and faster. Turtle Island began to spin faster and faster. Grandmother Moon and Grandfather Sun knew they had to work together, so they pushed and pulled and pushed and pulled to slow down the spin of Turtle Island. And it came the day and the night and the seasons and the months and the years. And all of the stars reflected this in unison. And then Wasaka Jack watched as all of the animals felt that breath, felt that wind, and took their first sacred breath ever. <gasps> and they were filled with wisdom be and knowledge beyond their years, which they were to share with all of the two leggeds, all of us. And then Wasaka Jack held that beautiful muskrat in his arms, and he took another deep breath. <gasps> and into the muskrat. Muskrat <gasps> took that sacred breath and returned to life. Wasakajak was so thankful for her sacrifice and that to this day the muskrat has always been associated with sacrifice, with wisdom, and with unconditional love, but also perseverance because she did reach the bottom and she did do it. And now that was the recreation story. And so I think it's also a warning story too, because it was the recreation story. I'm like, I don't want to do over. I think we could fix this. And so um, the song that I'm going to share with you is the Cree creation song, hmm. which is, um, I learned it from a good friend of mine, Night Sun. And um, we actually did kind of a song exchange. So I sang on her album with my little guy and my little guy, he's huge now and his voice is really deep and it's freaking me out. Um, but uh, it was just a beautiful exchange. And I think those exchanges are the best when you can just exchange something for something that you need for something that someone else needs. So I've exchanged drums for things like house cleaning <laughs> or massages or, um, you know, medicines for sure. Or um, one thing that I've exchanged drums for is uh, a drill set, which is awesome. So, <laughs> but I think that's truly what the best uh, use is. It's, you know, exchanging for, you know, with people, with 
things that we need, things that we have and things that we need in that abundance. Um, but that that includes songs. So a lot of the songs that I have um, been gifted and songs that I carry with me, they were an exchange. And that's what it needs to be. That's what protocol is. It's an exchange. It's an exchange of energies, an exchange of intentions. And so um, this song is that. And the cool thing about this song too is being the Cree creation story. It is Cree. And I brought it to visit my aunt, um, who is, she's my great aunt, she's in, ex she's in care right now, um, just because she has a lot of complex needs. Of course, she's, she's older, of course, <laughs> she, she needs a lot of help, and, um, but it's really wonderful to be able to see her. I miss actually going to visit her in person with the drum and being able to share with her, but as a... Uh, one time that I, I did get to see her, I was drumming and singing this song, and then she started to sing along with me. And I was like, Auntie, you know this song? She's like, where did you find this song? This is our family song. And I was just overwhelmed and I was brought to tears. And even now I'm just, it's amazing how that reclamation happens. You know, reclaiming who we are through spirit, through song, um, and through exchange, through protocol, because that's, that's how it needs to be done. Uh, and so this is the Cree creation story, or song, <laughs> to go with the Cree creation story, which I just shared. Uh, I'm a little teary. Ooh. This is my beautiful drum. Exchanges and protocol. So um, this song, this was shared with me from my friend Lacey, and she had learned it from an Anishinaabe elder, and um, 
This song is, uh, it's called The Mother's Song. That's how I learned it. I learned it as The Mother's Song because it's in the song, it's the mother calling out and her children calling back. And um, there's versions where I sing it where you can hear the children drifting further and further and further away. Um, as a mother, that's one of our greatest fears. And unfortunately, that was something that we had to endure with the residential schools when our children were ripped from our uh, lives. And, you know, our children didn't have an opportunity to learn um, what they needed to learn how to be proper parents, learn that they were loved and they were valued, um, and those traditional ways of knowing, which um, they're so amazing, because that's really what has led me on my healing path and the way that I've dealt with trauma and the way that I've repaired my own relationships with my uh, family and my own relationships and, you know, being a good parent, um, I was able to break that cycle of intergenerational trauma and abuse by reclaiming who I was as an Indigenous woman, by honoring, you know, those teachings, by sitting in ceremony, um, by knowing these songs, and to know the traditional background behind it. Um, and I'm so thankful that we're in a time where people are starting to come back to those traditional ways and seeing how they can heal our families. Um, and so this is how I learned to be a better mother was through our songs and through our stories and through smudging. Um, and through sitting in ceremony. Sorry, I'm getting I'm so emotional on it. What's going on with me? <laughs> uh, and no, not sorry. Never apologize for your tears. Your tears are, it, it just shows that you love and you care so much that it has to be an outward reflection. Um, and so it's, it's a gift. Tears are a gift. But um, this song goes to honor all mothers. Mothers that are raising kids. Mothers that have lost their children. Children that have lost their mothers. Um, and everyone in between, but it's really about how the community steps in and um, calls you back. So, with that unconditional love. So this is the mother song, and I thank Lacey for teaching this to me, and it really sticks with you. So uh, all of the songs that I've learned, some of them I've attempted to learn many, many, many times, and they just won't stick with me, and it's because I'm not meant to carry that song. And I understand and I respect that. And honor the teachings behind that. But this song, first go, and I totally remembered it. So <laughs> it's also known as the Wildflower Song, which I just heard it on YouTube as that. I'm like, oh, that's another song, that's cool.
I don't know what happened. I think I inhaled dust. I was cleaning my house yesterday and I got a lot of dust in there. But before I go, I'm going to share one more song um, that talk about full circle and it coming back around. Um, this is the, uh, I love to share this closing song. This is the travel song, the traveling song. <clears throat> I first learned it from my elder Sharon Prue Turner. Um, unfortunately, she's not with us, but I feel like she's always with me whenever I sing this song. And so this is why I love sharing it and I love singing it. And I thought I had lost it for so many years. <clears throat> um, and then it was like a miracle. I was working uh, on a project with um, the High Performance Rodeo as the Indigenous Liaison. I was very thankful that they, they brought me on in that role. Um, and I was working with just amazing artists. And for one of the projects, uh, Yolanda and Ashley were like, hey, can you help us sing the song? I was like, sure. Can you teach it to me? And they're like, yes. And they started singing and I was like, oh, it's back. <laughs> so um, it was so beautiful and be like, I know this song. It's okay. You don't have to teach me. I know this song. Thank you for bringing it home. Um, and so this song is the Anishinaabe traveling song that teaches us that no matter how far we go, there's always a road back home. And home is where we make it. Home is that connection to our family, to our heart medicine, to people who we take on as family. So we have friends that are our family. This is where I have a lot of sisters from another mother. Um, but also, you know, about that community connection and that always brings us home. You know, that our ancestors are always with us to guide us on that path to lead us home. And no matter how far we go, there's always a way to come back. <clears throat> and this is what our healing journey needs to be. It's not about shame on that journey. It's about learning and growing and being better and doing better. And so this is the traveling song. <clears throat> Hopefully I'll get my voice. postponing <laughs> because I get to hang out with elders all day which is super exciting uh, and it's just wonderful to be able to do that so um I might I think that's a great excuse not to be here next Tuesday I get to hang out with elders um but it's just a gift to be able to learn from them from all of their different perspectives and to hear their stories which is just so inspiring and to laugh and to cry you know, in the same moment which I just love about hanging out with elders and you know all of the teachings that they share but all of their just journeys that they have been on are just so insightful and inspiring and so that's where I might be next week. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, if I get done early enough, I will be online. Um, but I want to thank everybody for joining me. Um, 
and yes, have a wonderful, wonderful week. I think I am about to have myself a cup of cedar tea because um, it is antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral. So if there's anything going on in my throat, it's going to fix it. But also it's an antihistamine. And I know with all of these wonderful, wonderful flowers blooming, I'm having some issues <laughs> and I need some allergy regulation. But um, again, uh, hi, hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much and Magwitch for sharing it with me. And I will see you next week. Bye. <laughs> we have better sound. It'll be great.